Okay, good morning um, and a very warm welcome on this beautiful day to Thornton Science Park. My name's Louise Wood. I am the Head of Commercial and Student Communications here at the University of Chester and I'm delighted to welcome some of you in real life um, and many of you virtually, so good morning. Um, just a bit of health and safety before we start. Um, there are no planned fire alarms uh, due to take place this morning. If a fire alarm does go off, please either follow myself or my colleague Martin at the back of the room to the muster point, which is um, outside. We do, however, have a planned site siren, which is due to uh, go off at 10 o'clock this morning. But just remain seated. <laughs> it is simply just a test. Um, so, as I say, I'm delighted to welcome you to um, our, I've lost count of how many of our business growth events we've been having, um, but for this one on embedding enterprise and harnessing research, we have quite a packed agenda this morning and I'm delighted that we're joined by so many esteemed colleagues from the university who are going to be talking to us about the ways that both students and businesses can benefit from the many opportunities that we offer here at the University of Chester. Um, I'm also delighted that we're joined by some of our commercial occupants this morning who will talk again about how um, that the USP of what we do at the university with our commercial occupants and again the benefits that that brings to our student experience and also commercial benefit. And finally, um, we are absolutely thrilled to be, uh, to be joined uh, this morning by our keynote speakers from the National Nuclear Laboratory, um, a real um, positive for us this morning and we are very much looking forward to hearing what they have to say and how indeed we may well work together in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker of the morning, who um, is going, whose title is the ABCs of Embedded Employee Engagement and that is Adam Crane from the Employee Engagement Coordinator. Thank you. Oh, and I should say, make sure you stay within this area so we can hear you. <laughs> okay, I'll try, I'll try. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, and yeah, for those new here, welcome to Thornton. Uh, my name is Adam Crane from Careers and Employability. So I work in a central service that works uh, to facilitate engagement between employers, students and academics at the university. So I called it the ABCs. I don't want that to come across school kiddish, uh, but there is a point behind this title. I speak to many businesses um, on a daily basis and some of them say to me, just tell me the ABCs on how to engage with students. We don't need to know the fluff. We need to know how to get involved, what are the benefits and what are the impacts? So that's, the, that's a bit of the story behind the whole point of the title. I've worked in academia and, um, and HE industry engagement for 10 years now. Um, I'm, I'm, I've just tipped over my 10 years at the University of Chester um, and I lead currently on workplace experiences. So they're all of our extracurricular placements and internships, uh, but also new at the moment is employers in the curriculum. So this is how as a sector we're responding to changes uh, about how employers engage with students and graduates and in curriculum engagement is a particular focus for universities at the moment. So that's how we bring employers directly into teaching and how they can influence and impact teaching uh, and even assessments as well. So we'll cover that in just a moment. But like I said, we are changing how, how we want employers to engage. So th 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 this first letter I want to talk about, A, is about authenticity and it's about the real world. We learn theory, the students learn theory within their academic study and quite a lot of programmes of study, particularly science and engineering uh, and, and students aligned to the business school, for example, they do undertake a lot of authentic learning with employers and businesses. But we need to ask ourselves, how do we assess what students learn? We're moving past the days of traditional written assignments. Um, we're starting to think of more imaginative ways in which we can get employers involved in how students learn um, and how we assess that learning. So is it reflective of the sector? Well, only you as the industry can tell us that. Only you can tell us if what we're teaching and what we're assessing is reflective of the skills needed for when students graduate after university. And is the project realistic as well? So sometimes when we speak to businesses and we're working on, on, um, on collaborative projects, sometimes we do have to just be mindful that they're working with sometimes level four, five or six students who will be at different levels of their, of their academic development. So we have to make sure that projects are, 
are realistic? And does it complement and underpin the theory of what they're learning? So everything we do with an employer, we want to make sure it links to what we call learning outcomes. And those learning outcomes are listed on every module descriptor for every module in the university that student, that student um, is on. So we want to make sure that every project links to those learning outcomes. So everything has to be authentic. And B is for bold. So we really want people to think different. We want students to think different, graduates and the businesses we work with as well. And it can be a great way to try out something, something new and exciting. So what's great about the University of Chester is maybe compared to some of our larger metropolitan uh, uh, competitor universities is that we work with a lot of businesses who are on the smaller end of the SME scale. So they tend to be our bread and butter for want of a better phrase. Um, and Working, working on projects within the curriculum could be a great way to try out new ideas, bring some enthusiasm into the business, bring some blue sky thinking from a student or a graduate, um, and, it could be, and it could be good to explore maybe some new processes. But be open to ideas. Could engaging students uh, work positively? Could it affect the culture of the business? Maybe you're a business that has been established for many years, maybe bringing a fresh pair of eyes in, uh, someone dynamic uh, might change the way things, things work. And how do we break barriers? This is particularly important for our placements. So the University of Chester, we're one of very, very few universities in the UK who have recently adopted an anonymised application process for all extracurricular placements. So what that means is if you, if you host the student on a placement or an internship, uh, when you're shortlisting a whole bunch of candidates, you have no idea of their backgrounds, their personal characteristics. You have no idea if they're male, female, their ethnicity, nothing at all. So it's completely and utterly blind, as we say. And that can help break some barriers down. But so can working directly in the curriculum and embedding some of that, some of that enterprise and maybe some of those early research ideas within some academic modules. It can help open opportunities for a wide range of students and graduates. And it brings learning to life as well. This is the important thing. Students can't just come to university to sit in a classroom and learn. They have to be able to do and develop those skills and have chances to, um, to hone some of the things that they've learned, but also put into practice. And for some students, it's actually even more critical. So if we look at design students, for example, building a portfolio is crucial to their career after graduation. So C is for connect. So en encourage autonomy and independence, yes, but keep connected. So we're encouraging a lot, a lot of employers to maybe off offer hybrid projects for students and use some of these tools that are available, whether it be Slack or Teams or any of those, those seemingly hundreds of collaborative platforms out there now, uh, but m make use of these. Students are well-versed. Students are well-versed in using Teams nowadays, using Messenger and WhatsApp. So try and use some of these tools. Focusing on the outcomes and deliverables, it'll give students a rigid structure to work to. And that's what I said earlier about those learning outcomes. That's why they're critical to working on student projects, to make sure that it relates to what they're learning. But it also gives you as employers an opportunity to promote your brand and create relationships with the graduates of, of tomorrow. Yes, it's good to engage, but also we must be mindful that the vast majority of organisations we work with are for profit businesses and you want to return on investment for your engagement. So you want to get the best talent um, and you want to engage the best students and graduates. And projects within the curriculum and embedding some of that, some of those early research ideas are a great way to do that. And help students develop those, uh, those critical sector skills. So shape the workforce of the future um, by helping students develop the skills, but it also helps academics understand um, what, they, what they need to adapt when teaching as well to meet industry demand. And this is where I mentioned earlier, employers in the curriculum. So the main parts of employers in the curriculum are active learning. Now, what, what this entails is a very short session where an employer would come in and talk about a scenario an issue. We actually held one, held, held one yesterday with psychology students and we brought in a clinical counsellor who talked about a very tough situation and the, and, and the students got into a discussion and thought how, how from what I have learned, how would I approach this situation? What are some of the considerations I need to take? 
Uh, now, these are quite early, early level interventions that can lead to deeper interactions with students and graduates. Then we move on to things like projects. We have two types of projects um, at the university in which we engage businesses with within the curriculum. They are universal projects, so the projects that could be drawn down. I'll give an example. We have a we have a car manufacturer who is developing some software engineering projects, but they're not necessarily involved. Um, but they provide the context. All of their colleagues provide some of the backgrounds for a project and students can work on those. Academics can use these to complement their other learning and te teaching and learning activities. Then we get more detailed, so we look at specific projects. These are ones that can have really meaningful interaction. So this is where the employer, or the business, is involved on a much deeper level. So you work with students to develop a project, to work on that project, and the business actually helps assess that alongside the academic. And I'll give an example. We're currently talking with um, a major events venue in Cheshire uh, who want to work with some events management students to develop some fully costed, fully planned out creative event ideas. They're going to be submitted as a portfolio and that business is actually going to sit on the assessment panel with the academic and help assess these in a real world scenario. So it brings their learning to life. And they're also hopefully going to offer some graduate internships and, and opportunities afterwards because that's the, that's the name of the game. So the process for this, we try and make it as simple as possible. And we use we use a sort of five step process, which is around identifying the project idea. We provide businesses a framework so, so, so you don't have to think too much about how this may look within a university. We can provide a framework. We help frame it according to the level of study and the module which the student is on. We can match the project. Um, we assess the success of the project and we evaluate the impact. Now, this impact is important because, again, this is where the sector is changing, the university sector, and I'll go into this in just a moment. So a shared data approach to impact evaluation. Previously, whenever we engaged in an employer event or activity, it used to be the same old story. Can, would you mind filling in this form afterwards? Did you enjoy it? Yes. More often than not, students would tick, 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 generally the middle column because it was easy to do and it wouldn't give us any real meaningful data. So we tried to reimagine what is the impact of businesses engaging students within the curriculum and we want to share that data with businesses as well. So as well as informing us as a university, this is the impact of our activity with the students. We also share the impact data with the business so you can understand the impact of what you're doing with our students. And it might help um, cover some maybe CSR activities you're doing. It will cover some of those elements. But also as well, when it comes to things like placements, we actually share all of the applicant data with you. So you get a full anonymized applicant database which shows the breadth of students who have applied for your opportunities. So, so you can see if you're attracting certain types of students from certain backgrounds or certain levels of study. So our impact when it comes to business engagement within the, within the curriculum and employer engagement is we do it on a short, medium and a long term basis. That short term is that experience. So it does come back to that very simple survey. However, we've slightly altered from using a survey format. We use Net Promoter Score. Um, which, which, which gives an indication of essentially customer satisfaction to a service so that we can so that we can start to identify trends. The medium term is what we call career readiness. Now that might not mean much to you as a business, but ultimately every student upon enrollment uh, at first year, second year and then at third year, we ask them a series of questions and we, re we repeat that year on year during enrollment and they move through a career thinking journey. Now the data UK wide shows that the faster they move through that journey, the higher chance of a graduate level outcome for that student. So we want to see does the activity for those students who participate, does it make them move through that career thinking journey quicker? And then the long term impact measurement is around graduate outcomes. Does the activity have an effect on a student achieving a positive graduate outcome? Do they go on to either further level study or do they go on to a graduate level role or start their own business? So what effect does that have versus those who haven't un undertook um, employer projects within the curriculum? So something we say to both uh, both businesses and students 
is ready, set, engage. Engage well and the rest will follow. Those results, meeting those students and creating a talent pipeline, all of that will follow. So before we move on, I am just going to pop up my contact details here for those people who are interested in, in talking about these opportunities, but I'm sure the, the event team will send those out with some follow-up follow up details anyway. Um, I'm actually going to cover another part because my colleague can't be here today. Um, so it's uh, on behalf of the, of the venture team. So Kirsty Badrock, who may be familiar familiar to a few of you has, has just had a, had a beautiful baby boy so she's at home enjoying um, new parenthood so I am going to cover uh, her venture part for her uh, as well so I'll move on to that. So the venture program for some of you may uh, for some some of you who uh, who may be familiar is it's an enterprise uh, program for students and graduates who are looking to effectively start their own business or to or to freelance and it supports those aspiring entrepreneurs through a variety of activities but it helps develop things like skills confidence knowledge and those connections to make it further within the business world it's a comprehensive program of nine online training topics and you can see these listed here i'm not going to read them all out but these are the key things which the venture program touches upon and we bring in a whole series of mentors from industry from from people who've set up set up businesses who have lived the experience to come in and to deliver these these training sessions now the pitch culminates in uh, sorry the venture program culminates in the pitch rather which is the the end of year big event um Think of it like a Dragon's Den style event. Students ultimately pitch their idea and we have we have an amount of, of funding available, but also a number of business prizes that that might be access to networking facilities, clubs. Uh, it might be um, tangible things that would help. So if it's a graphic designer, would a new iPad help? Could they access the latest software? But students pitch in front of a panel of judges very well established, uh, but we always try and get a few new ones every year on there um, and they pitch their business ideas. They undertake a bit of a gruelling Q&A, <laughs> not quite on the same level as, as Dragon's Den, but still nevertheless puts them through their paces. Um, and over the past nine years, we've awarded over £55,000 to help support businesses in their, in, their, uh, in their ventures. We also have the Santander Entrepreneurship Fund, which is a £250 business grant uh, or fully funded office space. And that's courtesy of Santander Universities UK, of which we are one of the, one of the Santander universities. So I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour of how careers and employability engage businesses and employers within the curriculum, uh, both for those looking at working in a role and for those uh, looking at starting their own business as well. Thank you very much, Adam. That was a really good oversight. Um, both, I mean, this event is both hybrid in terms of at home and in person, but also in terms of our audience base. We've both got businesses and students, so it gives a great flavour of the opportunities available to students um, and as to how they can become work ready, for want of a better phrase, and equally how businesses can benefit from that. Um, and it leads us perfectly onto our next speaker, who um, is uh, the exemplar of, um, of, ex of what can happen um, in the most uh, beneficial way to both parties. So um, I'm delighted to welcome Rebecca Meadow who is co-founder of Motrack Research Engineering, who happened to be a commercial occupant here at the University of Chester. Rebecca, you're very welcome. So, hello, good morning everyone. My name's Rebecca Meadows and today I want to talk to you about why you should support student placements. And I think I'm extremely well versed to talk about this topic because I myself am a Chester graduate. I studied at Chester for five years, studying and completing my master's in chemical engineering. And I am now part of a new company, Motrap Research, which was founded by graduates. So to give you a bit of an agenda of what I'll talk about today, I'll touch on my journey as a student, the evolution of Motrap Research, benefits to both students and businesses. I'll touch on the skills gap, which I think is a really key topic. And I'll also talk about our commitment at Motrap Research 
to endeavouring to support student placements. So my journey through university. I was extremely fortunate in the fact that I studied at Chester because Chester have worked so hard to build relationships between students and tenants on site and in the surrounding area. And so in my first year at university, I undertook a placement at Ultramex who are on site at Thornton and also have a plant in Bromborough. And so I was able to get my teeth into the real working world for the first time. I studied the remediation of waste from aluminium smelting. But it was all made possible due to the speed networking events that the university holds for every year group to get involved. And on reflection, thinking back now to when I was a first year with no confidence, shaking, you know, terrified, it was the perfect experience to to experience industry for the first time. It was a safe space and that was all through the guidance of the university. And so moving on in my second year at university, I secured a part time position at Motat Race, a company on site at Thornton where I was involved in heading up a project with a fuel treatment client and I was involved in um, the planning, execution, analysis of fuel chemistry. Um, they wanted to develop their product and look more R&D. And the best thing about this position was the fact that I could literally walk out the door of my lecture and walk into work because it was all on the same site. You know, and I think that's a really unique part of being at Thornton Science Park. Um, and so I worked with a fuel treatment client and they they actually then increased their investment in R&D and MoTrack and increased their partnership. And so it created a unscheduled year in industry for myself where I continued the R&D work and product development. And Oh, I think I've missed a bit. I've missed a bit about uh, in my second year. Um, I actually obviously continued at MoTrack, but um, it was throughout my assessed module placement. Now, if up until this point students haven't had a chance to experience industry, it was actually now required as part of the curriculum. So you cannot leave Chester University without ha having at least one connection and one work experience on your CV. And so, yes, now I'm in my year in industry. Um, and I talk about the support of MoTrack and it was actually it was carried through. It was reinforced. So when I come to undertake my masters, it was it wasn't even questionable. It was the fact that MoTrack were going to support me. We built that partnership. That connection was so strong. I'd been at MoTrack now for four years and it was it was almost like, you know, I'd never not been there, to be honest. Um, and so that brings us on to 2021. Last year I graduated not in person due to COVID, but that's to come. And it was also the birth of MoTrack Research. So MoTrack Research, what's it about? So MoTrack Race originally had automotive expertise for 35 years plus. And clients approach MoTrack Race due to those automotive expertise and the demand for R&D in different areas grew and grew, particularly in emissions monitoring. And so we said we need to cope with this demand some way. And I think the best way to do that is to create a new company specifically for R&D and the growing demand in sustainability and green technology. And so that's what we did. And it's not just myself and Steve Hammond, the director of MoChat Race. There's also Matthew, who is a mechanical engineering graduate at Chester, who also undertook a placement at MoTrack Race. We also have Sufian, who is a chemical engineer like myself, and he also undertook a placement at MoTrack Race. Bit of a pattern. And so we decided this 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 is a need for this company because our predominant aim is to democratise emissions monitoring because there's such a huge monopoly in the industry currently um, and it needs to change. You've got devices that literally cost the earth and are out of reach. Um, and then you've got devices on the other hand of the spectrum, which are unreliable, inaccurate. It's actually a surprise why they're even used in the industry. 
And so we want to make emissions monitoring accessible and accurate, and that's what we strive to do. And so obviously we know there's a huge global push and global responsibility to reduce our emissions. And the first step in doing that is actually knowing what your baseline is, knowing where you start. So you have to monitor because you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So benefits to business. So students, they, they are coming fresh out their lectures with their ear to the ground. You know, they've got the latest skills, the latest information, the latest knowledge from their lecturers who are experts in their industry. And where are they going to bring that? Straight to your company. They're going to bring it straight to your door and straight to your workforce. It's also the fact that not only will they bring that endless bound of, of attitude and energy and inspiration, but they'll also bring creative thinking which is an essential skill in any industry, problem solving, critical thinking. And we talk about maybe thinking outside the box. Well, students, they've never been in that box to start with. Their imagination has no restrictions. They see problems as challenges. They want to step up. They want to impress you. And not only that, but if you partner with the university, you are not only going to be you're not going to be the only one. There's going to be other companies there. There's going to be other students there. There's going to be other academics there. You really get to immerse yourself in a culture of, of the next generation and, and innovation. And so collaboration is key from all parties, from students, from businesses, from education institutes, even to a level of, of maybe government, governmental and local authority bodies. You know, we all need to have this conversation together. And also placements, they they act like a extended interview, as I say, because, you know, you're seeing if that student's the right fit for you. And they're also seeing, do I want to work for this company? Are they are they the right fit for me? Because it's all about how you work together and how you present yourself in a team. And a placement is, is just that, an extended interview process. And they are going to leave university with not only the skills from their degree, but they leave with specialist knowledge of industry, but not just any industry, your industry at your company, ready for you to hire them at the end of their graduation. And so I, I don't think we've got any students in the audience, but there might be some online. So this one's for you. So benefits to students. Well, if you think about it, if you leave university, you will quickly realise that it's a very competitive job market. There's, there's a lot of people who want the same job as you. You're going you're gonna to be there outside your interview and you're going to look down the line of the other candidates. And guaranteed, you know, they've probably all got the same skills. They've probably all got the same qualifications. You know, they might even have gone to the same university. And so employers you know that's that's kind of a given that should you, you tick that off but they want to know what have you done and what can you do for me what sets you apart and it's also the fact that obviously we know as we go through university we we develop as a person you know we move away from home for the first time we learn to do the washing the ironing even though we might not do it but we also your your professional development doesn't it doesn't start until you step into that office on your first day. It doesn't start because you don't learn those skills in you don't learn those skills in your lectures. You don't learn how to communicate with your team effectively. You don't learn sales. You don't learn how to present yourself. You don't learn critical thinking. You learn those on the job while you're there. You have to be there in the first place. I cannot stress how important experience is. It's really there's no ifs or buts. You need it. You cannot have too much experience on your CV. It is impossible. And so that brings me on to the skills gap. Now, the skills gap is is basically a mismatch, a mismatch between the skills that employers need in their workforce and the skills that university students are leaving with. And so there's two sides of the coin. 
OK, students are leaving university. They can't get a job because they haven't got experience. On the other side of the coin, you've got businesses who obviously they they don't want those students. They've got no experience. So. What do we do about that? Well, there needs to be this conversation. Students need to be more involved in businesses, but businesses, you need to be more involved in students. You need to be part of the education process. You need to tell education institutes what you want from your graduates. You need to start that conversation. And so 71% of UK businesses have agreed and said they have a skills shortage in their workforce. 54% of UK businesses have said that they agree apprenticeships and placements are that solution to the problem because you have to learn and work and it is the future, especially in maybe a STEM related degree where practical skills are extremely valuable. And 66% of UK businesses have said that actually it's soft skills that they're missing. It's all, you know, what I talked about before, communication, sales, presentation, teamwork, critical thinking, all of these skills are missing. And yes, you might do a section at university, but it's not until you're presented with a real life problem with real life pressures that you actually can show what you can do. And so again, we need to have this conversation. It needs to be students, businesses, universities, government bodies, local authorities. We all need to get involved in this conversation because the problem isn't going everywhere and it's it's increasing year on year. I saw a stat in 2019, 54,000 engineers. We were short. I think it's 182,000 now. It's growing year on year. And so that brings me to our commitment at MoChat Research. We want to make sure that students are given the same opportunities that I was and that my team was because we all deserve it, because we all have that potential to show what we can do. And actually to tell you right now, we're all STEM educated in the team, but actually we're in business now. So guess what we've done? We've hired a business student. It makes sense. They win, we win. We're learning from their latest knowledge, their latest skills, their experts in the field are teaching them. And then they help us to understand and they get to put that textbook to reality for the first time and show what they can do. And so I've got a video that uh, hopefully plays. I heard there's a bit of technical difficulties, but I hope this gives you a summary of what I've just been talking about. My name's Steve Hammond. I'm the Managing Director of MoTrack Race Engineering and now MoTrack Research Engineering. We try to give opportunities to students, whether it be through placements, work experience, paid employment. Actually, the team that we have now, I've worked with them all on and off for a number of years. Hello, my name's Rebecca Meadows and I work for MoTrack Research Engineering. My name is Matthew Lockwood. I work for a company called MoTrack Research Engineering Limited. My name is Sofiano Slimogadam and I work for MoTrack Research Engineering Limited. This has been a very organic process, as I say, with some very talented um, individuals. They were all coming to the, the end of their uh, studies at the same time. I sort of suggested to the three of them that uh, perhaps we should do something with this. Rebecca, Sofiane and Matthew all unanimously said, oh yes, I'm in, I'm in for that, that's great. The whole point was that they all have a stake in the company, they've all got a vested interest, they can take this further forward. MoTrack Race Engineering has over 35 years of experience and specialities in the automotive industry. So originally clients approached MoTrack Race due to the automotive expertise. As the demand grew, it only made sense to evolve into this new company, relying on the engineering excellence developed by the previous company. We now offer a range of services due to a growing demand in R&D, and that could be with product development, data analysis, and also we're particularly a specialist in emissions monitoring and air quality. We're also working in industries for flue gas analysis, particulate matter analysis. We help our partners in problem solving uh, with some of the things that they have. We also have our products which we then use for some of our clients. So it's a, a wide variety of things that we do at MoTrack. You know, the world needs to keep turning and we are 
renowned for our delivering on engineering excellence and, and, and on our projects and taking things across the line and ex exceeding those expectations. Given that we had an excellent um, chemical engineering course and mechanical engineering course at Chester, it provided, if you like, oven ready students <laughs> to, to get involved with projects. So yes, they, they could start learning while they were studying, because for me, doing is learning. I secured a part-time R&D position at Mochat Race, and that allowed me to study in between my lectures, which is completely unique, and I've never heard that at any other university before. So that allowed me to complete my lectures and then also work in industry at the same time. At the Faculty of Science and Engineering, we do uh, these four week long placements at the end of our first year, and that's and I met Motrack at a speed net networking event. It was great. I had the opportunity to work on a real world project, so it wasn't something you know where they just tell you, okay, you're doing this for a month basically, and it doesn't go anywhere. But this was a real world project where I actually had input on a product. I think employers really look for tangible skills, communication skills, time management, being organised, integrating into a team with others, a real world industrial placement of a company. There's a big, big emphasis on, on it and it, it, it's, it's paramount for engineering success and allowed me to immerse myself in a real world application with real world pressures. I think it's absolutely essential to do a placement while, while you're studying at university because you study something in class but it's not until you've seen you know you've seen the knowledge being applied in real life that you actually gain you know an understanding of it you don't appreciate it enough until you actually see it in the industry I gained a lot personally and professionally. I think completing a placement allows you to build those skills that you need to succeed at any organisation, so it equips you with soft skills and also the technical expertise. We've really got that engineering excellence on site and it really sets us aside from being on a standard industrial estate, for example, versus being on Thornton Science Park. And it means you can immerse yourself into an academic slash commercial slash industrial um, hybrid. It exposes you to things that a traditional university campus wouldn't expose you to. It gave me opportunities that I didn't think I would get. They've got to be there in the first place. You also had uh, access to other companies and it made it easier to network. There was just no opportunities like this where which would allow for you know progression career-wise and you know it would also be a creative outlet uh, for us because we got to work on different projects all the time. Mochat Race and Research Engineering have received a huge amount of support from the team at university. We're on the lookout all the time for students to join our team because that allows them to apply the knowledge they've gained from their degree, and it could be any STEM degree, and apply that knowledge to real world problems, to solve solutions, and that's essentially what we do every day at Mochat Research. that gave you a little bit more of an insight. And I hope today my talk has, has made you understand why I'm so passionate about this topic and why I care. I hope that we can all agree how invaluable placements are to students and businesses. And I hope it, it's clear that integration is key. You know, we need that conversation between all three and we need it now. Employers, you have the opportunity to open the door to students and they are knocking. Thank you. Huge thanks to Rebecca there. I think um, that's definitely generated some excitement in the room in terms of uh, highlighting the, the great opportunities that are available and what comes of them. Um, so before um, we have our break uh, shortly, I'm thrilled to uh, bring up Dr. Elizabeth Christopher Lee, um, sorry, Dr. Elizabeth Christopher, who's joining us from the Research and Innovation Office, uh, who's Director of Research and Knowledge Exchange. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Louise. Um, so I was originally uh, expecting to have a colleague with me here today, but I'm doing, I'm, I'm flying solo, so I'm hoping I can cover all of the material that, I, that we'd planned. So what I want to talk about a little bit is about how businesses uh, and other organisations, charities, uh, government bodies can interact with universities. Um, 
Um, and they can do so in, in a way, really a, um, wide variety of ways. And some of the terminology that universities use uh, can be a little bit unfamiliar outside of the sector. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a flavour of that um, and also to reassure you that actually it's our business to help you understand and for us to work out what the what the problem is. So, um, but I do think it is useful to have a little bit of background um, understanding. So sometimes the way we define in universities activities, it can be actually um, uh, influenced by the motivation for, act, for undertaking the activity. Uh, it can be motivated by uh, the funding that's available. Um, and often projects can have a wide, diff um, a wide variety of elements to them. So rarely does a project perhaps fit into a single, a single category. So um, the first category I wanted to talk a little bit about is research. It's a term that's used very broadly. Um, it's usually used in the context of um, the, the motivation being to generate new knowledge uh, it can be it can be applied, so it could be looking to address a specific problem, or it can be um, called you know blue skies research. You're just motivated by uh, the desire to increase a body of knowledge. It usually has an element of um, a need to disseminate that knowledge that is created. That's one of the key things about how universities uh, describe research. Um, the next term is uh, knowledge transfer. Sometimes it's referred to as consultancy as well. Um, it's a type of activity where external organisations want to access the knowledge that is held by our academic staff uh, and, and can be uh, also accessed through students. It's often about applying existing knowledge to slightly different problems. So understanding that uh, whether you've got the right expertise that you can use the solution to problem X for, you know, uh, a solution for problem X to problem Y. So it's about understanding and having that really deep understanding of the subject area which enables you to do that. Um, knowledge uh, transfer is usually about developing um, a solution that is of specific interest to the partner and often only to the partner and usually uh, there is a confidentiality around those uh, that, that work as well not always but sometimes and then a term that's been introduced in only really in the last few years is a knowledge exchange and these and the, and the key there is in the word exchange it is about a two-way exchange of knowledge between that which is held within companies and other organisations and universities um, working together much more closely to actually to develop projects um, together. Um, so usually it's about where there's no obvious um, pro uh, solution to a particular problem um, and it's about sharing expertise um, and, and knowledge and, and really is, is, is a full collaboration. So uh, in terms of actually how businesses tend to interact with the universities, that can be very straightforward. You can pay for us to under undertake a project uh, which addresses a specific business problem. Very straightforward model. You might also, though, want to actually collaborate more closely um, where you're providing expertise into the project and so is the university. Both partners are collaborating and um, and both partners benefit. I think that's the real key element of, uh, that's where it makes it sort of knowledge exchange. Both partners are going to be benefiting it, benefiting from that collaboration. Um, you might also, through that collaboration, um, not uh, end up in, in with an arrangement where actually both parties are going to apply for external funding, perhaps from Innovate UK or some other organisation. So actually, in terms of um, it's not just about businesses paying for services, there can be collaborations which actually lead to funding from other sources. And depending upon the arrangement that you come to, um, the results might be confidential. That might be appropriate to the nature of the work or um, you might um, be able to um, have the exclusive right to exploit the knowledge. Um, or it might be that actually the, the, the motivation is, is this fundamental research and actually it can be shared and both partners um, benefit from that sharing of knowledge and being associated with that generation of new knowledge. So, so I say there is this uh, sort of a range of uh, definitions that we use um, 
and I say oh, it, it is the, the job of the university, but in particular our business development managers, to help you as outside organisations navigate the university. So uh, that's the important thing. So we, we will use different terms, uh, but that's not to say that uh, you know, you've, you've got to know exactly what to ask for. That's what, that's what we will help you do and to find those right contacts within the university. If you go to our, um, uh, what, you know, the university's website and look in the research and business section, you'll find again this same email address um, to contact, a single point of contact to help you uh, navigate the university, um, the university's organisation. Um, we've heard a lot about how you can involve students um, in your business. Uh, one of the an additional way is to through um, a knowledge transfer partnership. So these are programmes that have been running for a, a long time, actually. Um, yeah, more than 45 years. The university has in, been engaged in these. Um, we've got two projects running at the moment. We've had a few in the past um, and it's a three way collaboration between a business um, and a, a research an associate and, and the university. Um, so it's a, um, a graduate or postgraduate. Now they they're known as the associate um, and these are longer term projects of typically 12 months to three years. Um, and in the majority of cases, the, asso the associate secures a job at the organisation um, at the end of it, though that's not a requirement, but it's often mutual benefit. So it's, again, it's about this extended um, uh, a job interview, as it were. Um, there are a variety of different um, uh, sort of uh, nuances to the scheme. So obviously the, the business has to be UK registered and of a su sufficient size and have the financial capacity to be able to undertake this uh, longer term arrangement. Um, and, and then the other thing I just wanted to say um, was about um, the way these, these, these uh, arrangements are funded. So they're funded by Innovate UK and um, they are very competitive, but actually the success rates are quite high. Um, the, the, you've got a, a rough idea there of project costs uh, per annum, but these are heavily subsidised by the Innovate UK grant. So, uh, so for small and medium sized enterprises, you know, two thirds of, it, of the cost is actually funded externally. So really the, the KTP is com comparable uh, to uh, in cost to employing a graduate. Um, but what you're doing is building into that access to the university's expertise and the supervision of, of the associate, obviously within the business and from our academic staff. Um, and so these things, these projects are, are beneficial both to the business and to the university who want to engage in this collaboration. So um, then the other the other couple of ways in which um, the university um, can um, interact with businesses is through some matched um, match funding for studentships. So we have a scheme available at the moment uh, where businesses typically contribute around half of the stipend for a PhD student, um, and that would be a project for typically three years. Um, and so obviously the student is being supervised. Um, it by, by the academic staff and and through usually there's a contact to the business who's providing supervision to and we also have an innovation voucher scheme which offers a discount shall we say to first time collaborations with business to try and get uh, the interaction started so i just finally wanted to say a little bit about what the research and innovation office do because you know obviously we're a large organization so uh, my team are involved in the um the costings of how how a project will work and in setting up the contracts, but that is what happens further down the road. Your first point of contact really is is through uh, the business development managers and this um, you know business growth uh, email address etc. So um, I'm going to stop talking because I've got a lot of words on the next slide because I wanted to give you a sense of the breadth of research activities within the university. We've recently set up uh, four research and knowledge exchange institutes. These bring together the research activities um, and knowledge exchange activities from right across the university, which, which were organised 
sort of a departmental level. Now we're bringing these together to enable uh, more collaboration, uh, interdisciplinary research, and to, to make sure that we're actually uh, building um, a greater uh, strength um, in, in collaboration. So I say very, very broad um, uh, themes which these institutes are now bringing together, covering sustainability and environment, um, the health and well-being, culture and society. So much of that is work in the in the arts and humanities and in social science um, and then regional economy, which is is just starting uh, to form. So I say a great deal of breadth there, and I just wanted to give you a sense of the breadth of research that is going on at the university. Thank you. Great, many thanks for that, Elizabeth. And I think, again, that just helps to articulate. I mean, I must admit, um, even though I'm, I'm well aware of the institutes, just seeing it there articulated does uh, give a really good flavour as to the breadth of uh, topics covered. So um, for those of us in the room, I'll be, I'm delighted to say we've got some replenishments of caffeine and orange juice um, in, at the back. For those of you joining us online, we're just going to have a, a, a short pause. I believe we're starting back again at 10.50. Is that right? I'm looking at the back. Yes, I'm getting a thumbs up. OK, so uh, back virtually and uh, sat down at 10.50. Many thanks. OK, I think we're all back in the room and virtually as well. Um, OK, so moving on, um, I'm uh, thrilled to invite our next speaker, um, Devinder Lotte, who's the Managing Director of Ultimex. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about the importance of academic institutions and their relationship with industry from an SME's view. So very welcome, Devinder. Thank you, Liz, and uh, thank you to everyone here this morning, as well as the virtual, as well as in person. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the importance of academic institutions uh, and the relationships with industry. I think it's very important uh, to have this topic because I think it's going to summarise in a way what we've been talking about this morning, from what the industrial perspective is, from Rebecca, from the university itself. I think this will sort of marry the two together in some way, I'm hoping. Who am I? I'm, I'm Devinder Lote, Managing Director of Ultimax Limited. I'm also a board uh, uh, member of the Chamber of Commerce for a region, Governor at Cheshire College, and a board member of the Pledge Partnership. The Pledge Partnership is something that the Local Enterprise Partnership for Cheshire and Warrington brought about to try and engage the, the learning community with, with industry. Um, and I'm also a STEM ambassador. Uh, I've been for the last 30 odd years trying to bridge the gap which you, you spoke about earlier you know i've been taking on students for many many years i'm also a top 100 figure which was i was uh, given that award in 2019 by the manufacturer uh, they choose 100 uh, uh, manufacturers every year to who they give this award to what does ultimax do um ultimax was founded in 1995 uh, we've been going since 1995 and in its present ownership of myself and, uh, and a business partner since 19 sorry since 2004 uh, we've evolved the business in immensely, in, 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 a, in a very, very big way to what it was, to what it is now. Uh, just to give an impression, we were, as myself and a girl on the shop floor when we first took over, uh, with with a turnover of about eighty to hundred thousand pounds a year, to what we are now, uh, you know, eighteen to uh, eighteen to twenty three personnel in the business and a five to seven million pound business. So it has grown immensely over the years big challenges and that we've been talking about the challenges earlier on as well. We've got three divisions. We uh, uh, design and factory electronic systems, um, subcontract manufacture them as well. We do bespoke LED lighting solutions for a very, very wide variety of markets uh, in the heritage, uh, top end residential and uh, retail. Fiber optics, you may just see some drums at the bottom end on the left hand side. They are actually fiber optics, fiber optic cabling that will go in, into the ground. Uh, that provides uh, broadband to, to, to your home. They're mainly for the rural networks, the hard to reach places that BT Open Reach don't want to get to. So our clients use those to, to get to get to the people that don't actually have connectivity. We, award winning, uh, we've had uh, many, many awards, but the one I want to really, really emphasize on is, uh, is uh, the Cheshire Business Awards. We won the CSR award for what we do as a commitment to the learning community. We take on students, uh, you know, it is part of the culture. Hence, I brought up the question earlier on with Rebecca. The culture, culture is very, very important within the business that embraces 
the, the, the connection with the academia in some way. Yeah, and uh, we've, we've been shortlisted for the award of uh, awards for the uh, high sheriffs as well for enterprise. I think enterprise is within our our, our topic for today. This is Thornton Science Park. We have been here for a number of years now. Uh, I think when the High Growth Center came about, we were one of the uh, not part of the High Growth Center, but part of the um, uh, uh, university campus itself here. Uh, we were given a small shed at the bottom end, uh, one of four, not very far from Motorak itself. And fantastic, what a big move that was. Uh, it, it, it made us what we are now, actually. And I'll talk a bit more about that in, in, in a while. Um, location has provided us access to students um, and uh, academic facilities as well in different ways. Being part of the university site, it has actually made us or allowed us to tap into the different campuses, you know, business school, which I'll talk about in, in a short while as well. And of course here, yeah. Right, what's the motivation for university and industry collaboration? The you and the guys stand for university and uh, industrial collaboration and its importance. Well, from the university side of things, and this, this, this is my take on it, and it's not what I, I'm advocating as, as it being what, what, what our university does, but it provides an employment channel. Uh, we take on students uh, for, for, for uh, work experience. Uh, we take on students for placements, project work, and it gives us access. Uh, it, it gives access to the graduates to completing the studies because they need to actually have that industrial uh, uh, um, element in it, which you mentioned earlier on, Rebecca. Um, intellectual property rights, you know, interaction in terms of, you know, we can, we haven't ourselves commercialized it in any way using any of the IP that we've generated, but there was a project we were looking at with the, with the science and engineering faculty uh, pre-COVID and unfortunately didn't take off, uh, and maybe because of COVID itself, I don't know, but it didn't take off for various reasons. But it is a way to exploit that uh, IP in some way. Research collaborations, which we've talked about earlier on, you know, allows uh, alignment of motivations, particularly uh, when partners are driven by different incentives to co collaborate. Access to funding. You mentioned funding earlier on. Um, you know, we have access to funding indirectly, not, not money, physical money itself, but actually using the uh, the uh, the knowledge that some of the uh, academics have, some of the knowledge and experience that these students bring as well, because all those students are students learning, but they also have a lot of creative uh, backgrounds to 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 to, to their uh, uh, portfolio of of of, 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 uh, of work they've done in the past. These informal, indirect, and direct contacts allow us to be like, for example, today. Hey, that is an indirect and direct contact we're having today to. To, to engage uh, with businesses in some way, yeah. And we, I think uh, you spoke about frameworks, you spoke about frameworks as well. But there's a framework in place to, to support uh, from the university, not only the university, but also I work with the college as well as schools. There's always a framework that enables uh, businesses to actually uh, take on uh, students. Um, and there's a lot of support there. So that is the university engagement activities uh, that, that allow the motivation to be there for, for businesses. The industrial engagement, access to academics, you know, I mentioned that earlier on, um, is to collaborate with universities to access and develop interdisciplinary scientific, we, we're a science business, so the capabilities to solve complex solutions um, and to get support and for product development. Now, we have, uh, uh, and I'll talk about, talk about in the next slide, we have actually got quite a few case studies to, to show that we actually have uh, benefited from, from, from working with the university or, or learning community in, in a way. Again, research collaboration allows us to take us and learn new things that we, we as a business may not actually be aware of because when you're working in a business, you are so focused on what you're doing and don't realize what else can be can be can be possible or is happening outside of your of your work in some way, and to tap into some of the new thinking and new models of of of, of uh, uh, practices or uh, theories or actual physical outcomes that are possible from some of the science related activities, you know, commercializing in some way is, is possible. Again, funding for for, for for business for me, I want to know how can I make my products better for my clients. 
and in, in some cases you know it does require uh, uh, an academic or, or, or university or a student to actually help with that. Thinking out of the box you mentioned earlier on, you know, students come to a business without any preconceived ideas as to what the business is. Um, and they will think of things that you may not have thought of because you're so focused on what you're doing and don't realize there's other things and all other opportunities on, uh, which, which could, could, could possibly uh, lead to at the end of the day, business is business to make money and, and, and uh, provide a service to the customers um, and to employ people, of, of course. So yes, it does allow us to do that. So how has Ultimax interacted with academia? Well, we've provided work experience, uh, work experience for year 9, year 10 students all the way to, uh, uh, to master level students. Um, project work, uh, we took on a student a few years ago from the electronics department here. Uh, who worked on a live project. Uh, we always throw students with, into live projects. We don't give them a project to do on the side and forget about them. Uh, they are actually involved directly with our engineers, with our uh, staff uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. They become part of us. Uh, and, and, and on some occasions, when the student is left, we actually found a hole, <laughs> uh, you know, and sometimes it's hard to fill that hole. Um, but yeah, so it can lead to employment. A uh, classic example I can give you is we just taken on a, in a first apprentice, the business actually taken on. And I think there's a new story uh, that, that, that was put out uh, a few weeks ago. A student that came to me as part, from college as part of the T-level pilot program. Uh, they, have to, they have to spend 45 days uh, in a business and uh, he did well in his 45 days. Uh, and then on the last day, I always sit down with the student on the last day or the day before they leave and have a chat with them and then try and understand, you know, like an exit interview, what could we have done better for the next student that walks in through the door? You know, how can I improve it for, for, for them? Um, well, how do they find things? And one of the questions asked, asked me was, can I have a job this summer, please? And he got a job. So he worked for us during the summer period. And uh, that led him to take on more work, more uh, input into what we did on a daily day basis. Uh, and Went on to university. Unfortunately, COVID wasn't the right time for him. Um, he hated university. Sorry to say that. <laughs> university is not for everybody. We're not like all academics, and uh, you know we all have a different niches. He came back to me during the summer period uh, for job for work, just for the summer period, because I had no idea that he wasn't going to go back to university. And September came last year, and sat down with him, thinking, well, what are your plans for next year? I've got no plans, I'm not going to university again because I don't like it. So we sat down and worked at a plan and apprenticeship came about from all that plan. So he's doing a degree apprenticeship, which will lead him to a University of Chester degree at the end of his five, six years uh, of, of being with us. So that is a classic example. It has worked from T-level college student all the way to a degree level now, and he'll benefit from that. He's a more hands-on student develop relationships. We certainly made some relationships here today. You know, uh, I've not spoken to Rebecca for many, many, many months. Uh, I think you came to the, 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 the um, uh, I was interviewing at the, uh, uh, the speed networking event, and I think I did interview you, I think. And for, for example, yourself as well. Uh, you know, if you hadn't met me today, uh, it's, it's all about developing relationships. Conducting employability workshops. So I've been to several uh, schools, colleges, uh, and also to the university to talk about how to engage with industry. Engagement with industry doesn't just happen that easily. I know we all fear, you know, giving a CV to somebody. And I think the idea of a speed networking event where, you know, you have 10 minutes to talk your CV through for a possible job works very well. And I think we should, as a university, uh, uh, roll that out. I think we've already spoken about that, Emily. So it's, I think it's an opportunity here that we should not miss. So employability workshops are important, especially if they're being delivered by industry rather than a lecturer or a tutor, because it has a different perspective. Yeah. What have we gained? Well, we certainly gained a different perspective to obtain a solution. Um, case study. Uh, during the pandemic, I was looking to see how I need to become better as a business in comparison to my competitors. 
what do I need to do? Because I think the pandemic actually made me realize and think about what my business needed. So I engaged with the business uh, school, asked them for a business student and uh, a business student came, came forward and they did a remote um, um, uh, uh, internship with myself. And the task was, how can I become better uh, in terms of how I'm perceived by the outside world, basically social media and the usual that goes with it, the outside world. And uh, they conducted a, uh, a thorough uh, study into our competitors, what they did good, there's some echo there, sorry. Um, what they did good and what they didn't do good and how can we actually learn from that and um, apply that to, to, uh, uh, to, to, to become better. So after the eight, nine weeks of their work, they put, presented that to myself and I then put together a marketing plan out of it using the data and the information they put together. And that was all done remotely. So it can be done remotely, it can be done virtually. That's one of the case studies there. I hadn't thought of what they'd thought about and how to do it because again, they're not thinking inside the box, out of the box. Um, another good example of how uh, uh, exploratory research can lead to uh, innovation and uh, learning is uh, another project we worked on in uh, about 2019-2020 with another university um, looking at how lighting, LED lighting would, can generate, help generate hydrogen. Um, so we developed a system using different colours of light with different controls and we were able to generate hydrogen. Uh, again, pandemic came and the project came to a halt, unfortunately, and funding ran out. Um, so that was the uh, that was the exploratory research. We did a lot of got a lot of learning out of that. Support support for commercialization of R and D projects. Well, we had a student from the Faculty of uh, uh, Science and Engineering, electronic student, uh, three years ago. We had a project for aerospace where we all carry one of these with us. And I know we haven't done much flying in the last two, three years, but every aircraft, when you get on, you can't plug your phone into anything to charge it up. So our client came to us and said, can you develop a system? So we started work on that and we were lucky enough to get a student, um, John, and he worked on the system with us. He actually got his degree at the end, with, with, with a first class degree out of it at the end, with a project as part of his dissertation. He did a small element of the project itself. Again, that was uh, you know, commercialization uh, of, of a project there. He put together a, uh, a system to test and measure, and uh, uh, basically we were then able to produce those. We have actually now I can say that we actually produced uh, the first 600 units uh, this year. So uh, they've actually gone into, into aircraft. So that is just the start. Um, skills. Now, what have we gained as skills? Well, when a student comes to us, uh, you know, they are assigned a mentor or mentors. And uh, these mentors have never actually interacted with others, maybe. You know, they've not done. Uh, 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 as part of their learning and building up for, for the career progression, they'll have to, they'll have to uh, mentor a, uh, an individual, um, coach them, and they're building their skills in some way. But also, those are the softer skills. The harder skills are what they leave behind. Exam example I said was earlier that we lost a student, they went away and we, we had a gap. And uh, that knowledge you know, is important. Uh, so if it's captured in some way and kept in there, that's great, employing employing them. But skills, again, you know, we will learn from the students and also from the from from uh, from the um, um, academics if, when we do get involved in them. So why is it so important as a business? Well, I said thinking about why is it so important for us as a business and the, 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 I was looking for one sentence, and this sentence, I believe, uh, helps that uh, answer that question. Fosters innovation. Uh, there's continual in, in, in improvements, not continuous, but continual improvements. Staff development. My staff learn from the students when they come in, um, 
and it embeds some of the learning into the business itself to allow it to grow. We were talking about earlier on with yourself who, you know, you wanted to, you're running, a, you're starting a new business here. And one of the things for growth, one of the questions you asked was, what challenges did you face? It's the growth challenges. When we were, when we had had these growth spurts, the challenge there is how do we get to the next stage? Because for a small business, you can't afford to employ somebody full time. That's where a student comes in very, very handy <coughs> because they can fill in that gap for three months, six months as part of the project. But not only that, they actually enable you to either employ them or take it to the next stage. Yeah, so it's, it's, it helps. So I believe this sentence actually summarizes why, why it is so important for, for a business to take on uh, students and to have that relationship with, with the university or any uh, um, um, uh, education establishment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Davinda. I just want to take this opportunity to extend a personal thanks. Um, you are the exemplar of a commercial document, always willing to engage um, with our events and feedback and um, share your best practice. Um, so on behalf of the university, a big thank you, Davinda, for your time. So we come to our keynote speakers um, and I am delighted to invite up to speak to us this morning uh, Nick Smith, who is Academic and Engagement Lead, and Tim Whitworth, who is Head of Innovation from the National Nuclear Laboratory. You're very welcome. Thank you very much everybody um, and uh, also uh, may I extend um, a thank you for the uh, invitation to come and talk to you today. Um, it's uh, very gratefully received. So I've got about uh, 15 minutes and I'm going to give you a bit of a, a, a sort of romp through how the National Nuclear Laboratory interacts with the uh, universities um, before I hand over to my colleague Tim who's going to demystify um, our activities in the realm of uh, innovation. Um, so uh, yeah, without further ado, um, the, the National Nuclear Laboratory um, is a uh, fairly large organisation. Um, I'm trying to work out how many um, people work for NNL, but we've taken on approximately 300 people in the last two years, so we're growing. Uh, which I think makes us about 1300. We operate um, at uh, seven UK locations. Um, we have uh, a large, unique um, facility at uh, Sellafield nuclear site. Um, this is uh, the uh, where we are, are able to undertake research on um, highly active material. Um, and we have uh, uh, a user access um, uh, program that enables universities to come and undertake research there. Um, we have a large uh, rig hall, an inactive uh, rig hall at uh, our Workington Laboratory in Cumbria. Um, and we have a laboratory at uh, Springfield's nuclear site um, near Preston um, and several other locations dotted around the country. Um, I spent three years working at um, Sellafield, so um, I'm quite used to sort of industrial sites like um, like Thornton, so it's so sort of nice to be back in, in that uh, environment. Um, so just a quick um, romp through uh, or wander through um, our uh, university interactions. We were formed back in 2009, launched in 2009 from the uh, remnants of what was British Nuclear Fuels, um, who some of um, some of you may recollect used to own most of the nearby Capenhurst site. Um, so uh, um, we uh, started off small. We didn't have a great deal of uh, university interactions, but those have increased over the years, as you can see through this sort of uh, um, timeline. Um, so there are um, various um, uh, key happenings uh, along, along this. So that NNL is government owned. We're owned by uh, Bayes, that's our uh, owner, through something called UK Government Investments Limited, um, which I think is very similar um, to organisations like Channel 4 um, and uh, the Ordnance Survey. We're operated at arm's length as a commercial business. 
we don't receive any government funding at all. Um, we uh, undertake commercial work, so we are able to um, uh, uh, reinvest our profits into um, undertaking research and funding research. Um, and uh, uh, luckily we, we do make a, a profit, so that's good. Um, our turnover, I think, over the uh, past year is approximately 130, 140 million. Um, so, um, uh, and we're able to uh, uh, in, uh, invest that in um, research. So we've undertaken a few um, uh, programmes over the last few years to um, increase our involvement in university engagement. And I'd say that um, we, we interact from undergraduate right through to postdoctoral level. Um, we have uh, we engage through um, uh, NNL staff undertaking teaching and looking after co-supervising uh, undergraduates and master's projects. Um, we have uh, um, uh, look after PhDs. Um, and hopefully this this slide will give you a bit of a, an idea. So uh, on the left, we've got a map. Um, these are um, this looks at um, our investment over uh, five years. So it's approximately 30 million in nearly 50 universities. We're not just northwest focused. So we cover the uh, the whole country, as you can see. Um, and uh, um, those dots there just show the size of the investment. Um, and this currently kind of reflects the um, engagement that we've had with um, uh, uh, some universities over many years. So that probably explains the large dots at Manchester. Um, I'm, I'm actually based in Warrington, so I interact with Manchester as, as well. And I'll tell you about that a bit later. We currently have, this slide's a little bit old, so apologies for that. We currently actually have 117 PhDs in flight, which are either co-funded or co-supervised by um, uh, NNL. Um, we uh, um, interact with the uh, with UKRI. We receive we're in receipt of um, uh, case awards uh, for PhDs through um, both um, through research councils such as uh, EPSRC, um, and we have a team of uh, NNL staff. So nearly 600 NNL staff are technical folks. Nearly 200 of those have PhDs themselves. Um, and uh, we have approximately 80 NNL staff actually active, actively undertake industrial co-supervision uh, and actually undertake research themselves as, as well as part of their um, uh, day job. Um, I, I guess our, our um, key aims in terms of interacting with universities are um, to uh, service our um, uh, overall vision, which is nuclear science to benefit uh, society. And um, uh, we, um, I look at the, um, the red, um, I'll look after the red uh, area uh, on this diagram, uh, which we call our core science area. And Tim will tell you more about um, uh, the, how we're sort of um, uh, divided up and um, made up. Um, the, the, the core science um, area has um, in, engages with lots of uh, universities on research and um, uh, undergraduate in, interaction. And we're involved in a number of different um, programmes and um, uh, other uh, government funded initiatives. So uh, we have um, uh, an outpost of the National Nuclear User Facility, Hot, Robot, Hot Robotics Facility at our Workington Laboratory. So that's funded through um, UKRI. Um, we uh, led the um, Advanced Fuel Cycle Programme on behalf of Bayes, um, which is uh, uh, looked at um, new and um, uh, new uh, nuclear fuels for um, uh, new types of reactors. Um, we have another strategic program, which is the uh, Alpha Resilience Capability. So that looks at uh, building up skills in terms of um, uh, uh, understanding um, alpha particles. Um, we have uh, um, run a pilot for the last few months at our Preston laboratory called ANSIC, the Advanced Nuclear Skills and Innovation Campus. And that has involved um, universities undertaking research as, as part of uh, that. 
Um, and we, um, uh, we have a collaborating centre, uh, the first one in the UK um, looked after by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, and uh, that's um, based up, up in um, Cumbria. And we have something called CINDY. CINDY is the Centre for Nuclear um, Development. Um, and this is a, uh, a research hub where students, PhD students, undertake their PhDs embedded in our Workington Laboratory. So they spend 100% of their time uh, there. And um, there's a, a currently a, um, an invitation to tender out to universities to um, uh, form consortia to, uh, to look at being involved in that uh, CINDY programme. So I mentioned core science. We currently have 12 core science themes. These interact with the numerous cap technical capabilities within uh, NNL, but they act as um, uh, hubs for the research themes that we undertake with um, universities. And they, they're quite diverse. Um, so we've got, um, as you'd expect, being a nuclear organisation, there's a lot of things to do with reactors. So reactor chemistry, isotope um, separation, advanced fuels, thermal treatment. So that's looking at things like um, uh, how you treat uh, um, high level radioactive waste. Um, we've got um, a theme on nuclear safety. So um, that's things like critical, how you deal with criticality, um, irradiated fuel characterization. So that's looking at techniques to characterize um, and understand um, irradiated fuel. Um, and one that's close to my heart, decontamination science, um, that uh, looks at um, developing techniques to decontaminate um, legacy um, facilities and characterise materials in those facilities. And that those are uh, quite extreme environments. Um, and we have another thing that's all, another theme that's also um, close to my heart, which is environmental radiochemistry. So that looks at um, dealing with them. Um, understanding the subsurface at uh, locations um, that might impact on it. Um, we have some new themes. This might be of interest to um, folks at, uh, at Chester University. Um, we've got a, a health and nuclear medicine theme that is just about to uh, kick off. So that looks at the, um, we'll look at research um, into the production of um, medical isotopes. Um, We've got uh, a new theme on reactor technology and hydrogen and um, uh, nuclear hydrogen. So that looks at um, how we can produce hydrogen um, during the nuclear fuel cycle. So that um, um, brings in things like integrated energy systems and um, uh, co-generation. And we have a new theme on nuclear safeguards and security. And that also looks at things like, kind of somebody early on mentioned cybersecurity. So that's um, one of the areas of interest for us. Um, and through we fund and co-fund uh, research through each of these themes. Um, so uh, the ways of interacting with those themes are to talk to people like myself um, and the, uh, I can point you in the direction of relevant um, theme leads. So um, uh, and uh, there are, as I mentioned, there are quite a few um, uh, technical experts at NNL who, who are interested in um, interacting on research. Um, there's a set of uh, mug shots and that's me at the end, the rather suave looking character. Um, <laughs> not. <laughs> um, so man, many of these staff undertake research themselves and are very keen to interact with um, uh, universities, both at uh, undergraduate level um, through um, teaching on courses and at um, PhD level through co-supervision um, uh, I mentioned earlier we've got the um, uh, Cindy hub, so that's our uh, the lab up at uh, one of the labs up at Workington um, that hosts the um, Cindy PhD students. Um, I think we've currently um, had uh, 17 um, PhD students going through that process. We've got um, uh, Cindy two um, is uh, out for competition at the moment, so that will. Um, uh, be set up um, quite soon. We uh, interact with um, uh, industry academia consortiums such as Transcend um, and we also we look after the uh, Nuclear Decommissioning Authority's PhD bursary scheme as well. Um, so we co-fund and co-supervise PhDs at universities through that. 
Um, we also, uh, I mentioned that um, NNL staff um, interact themselves with universities through teaching and through um, undertaking research. So um, we've had uh, past experience of um, uh, uh, programmes such as the Royal Society's uh, Industry Fellowship and, and it's probably a good opportunity to blow my own trumpet. I, I, I like the idea of sort of leading by um, example. So um, when, when NNL first um, really started um, trying to increase its research capability and its uh, undertaking of research, um, I thought it was a good plan to apply for a, um, a Royal Society Industry Fellowship. I was awarded one, amazingly, um, um, and uh, I undertook that between 2013 and 2017 at uh, Manchester University. So it was a part-time secondment to the university that enabled me to carry on doing my day job. I'm a geologist by background. I spent 18 years at NNL as um, a geologist, the last eight of those as the lead geologist for um, NNL. In fact, Cheshire is my research area, so um, this is this is all my old stomping ground. Um, through that industry fellowship, I, I established and launched a research group, a collaborative research group called the Flame Group, which is uh, looks at using lasers to analyse materials in, in extreme environments. That's still going. We have um, currently um, six PhD students and a postdoc. Um, with um, we've uh, brought in, I think, approximately two million pounds worth of. Uh, research funding. We were successful in a, um, a UKRI, EPSRC uh, programme. Um, I currently undertake teaching responsibilities, so uh, I have a um, visiting honorary lectureship at John Moores University. I lecture on their uh, geography and environment programme. Um, I'm also a guest lecturer on the uh, um, MPhil nuclear engineering at Cambridge University. Um, and I hold two um, honorary professorships, one at Manchester and one at Liverpool. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm not the only one, there are lots of uh, uh, NNL folks who um, undertake similar activities. Um, so we're open for conversation. We, we would really like to um, work with universities, especially universities that we don't currently do much with, um, such as Chester. So um, please um, give me a shout. Um, and I'll hand over right now to Tim. Right. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview as to how we do innovation in nuclear and why it's important to NNL. We are a science and technology you know, research and technology organisation. Our purpose is nuclear science to benefit society. So science, research, innovation, it's in, our, it's in our DNA. And our science and technology agenda kind of basically guides how we operate as a lab. It's key central importance to the business and how we operate. Uh, as Nick's mentioned, we've got three pillars under that science and technology agenda. We have core science, as Nick's highlighted with a number of themes um, and our main university interactions. We also have strategic research, so this is about the future requirements for the sector, um, future national programmes such as our advanced fuel cycle programme and our advanced uh, alpha resilience capability. So that's all about what's going to be the next uh, requirements for the sector from an R&D perspective. And then obviously the most important one is innovation. And that's where we're looking to help identify, apply and translate ideas to support not only our business, but the wider sector, both from a skills perspective, but also from a technology perspective as well. That all requires ongoing research, innovation and leadership if we're going to maintain our expertise and skills so we can deliver those products and services uh, and deliver value to our customers. Underpinning all of this is collaboration and that's a key way in which we sort of move forwards with people. The key way we deliver the science and technology agenda is through collaboration, whether that's SMEs, universities, uh, other companies, whatever it may be. We can't do everything ourselves and we, we understand that. Across the business, we have four focus areas and all of our activities that we do align to one or more of these focus areas. Um, they're relatively new lenses that we're looking at through the business, so they're still in their development phases, um, but we have clean energy, so uh, hydrogen, as Nick's mentioned, 
um, advanced reactors, advanced fuels, that's all the drive towards net zero would come under that clean energy focus area. Environmental restoration, that's about how we manage and look after our legacy sites and waste management. So we have a cost, uh, cost effective and efficient uh, remedial action of our restoration of our nuclear sites. Um, health and nuclear medicine, so that's nuclear science uh, for healthcare applications, particularly around targeted alpha therapies. And then security and non-proliferation. So that's about ensuring we maintain as, as a strategic authority in security and safeguards. Um, I do have to confess to not really paying much attention to this group until about two weeks ago, uh, in which I became immensely interested in their view of the world. Uh, we'll probably move on from that. Um, so all of these focus areas are underpinned by our science and technology agenda, and that's helping them both with the technology side, but the innovation side, and how we can help them deliver on their missions over the next 5, 10, 15 years, whatever it may be. So how do we regulate, how do we innovate in a highly regulated industry? So there's a number of ways in which we interact for innovation uh, across the business, a number of ways that we kind of instill and sort of encourage ideas. But I'm going to talk to you about our challenge led approach and how we kind of get that across in the business. So this section will be about internally derived challenges. So once we first of all, we need to identify what that challenge is and then we start to understand what it could be and then develop a challenge statement. So you want to break it down into its constituent parts and really focus on what that true challenges and what the real issues are. Once we've got that challenge statement down and we've made it really accessible um, and kind of understood what the real key issues are that people need to kind of ideate against and encourage our colleagues to ideate against. We then promote that on our online platform. So we have uh, online platforms accessible to everyone in the business called the Innovation Lab. So we promote that out on there, lots of uh, media across our channels and get people to submit ideas. We get all those ideas in and then we may employ some gamification, such as we might do voting or tokens or whatever it would be, or we might just do a review panel and down select those ideas. Once we've got our collection of ideas that we believe are kind of tangible opportunities, we then fund those ideas, put project teams around them and develop them. And then from those, whatever comes through, we then look at deploying those in the business. So people can see the ask, the respond, the demand, down selection and then actual implementation. To give you an idea of the sort of cross sector of, of challenges that we've run in our business, we've done applications for AR and VR technologies. How can they support our business? Where can they have benefits for us, benefits and value to our customers? What do our customers demand? What's their future demand? And where can we see those AR and VR technologies really supporting us? Um, we've also done a green challenge. So how can our business be more environmentally friendly, less impactful, reduce the carbon footprint? Um, and one that I want to mention today specifically, actually, we've just launched a sustainability challenge, which we launched on Monday. Now, this is actually about encouraging trade based careers into the nuclear sector. So there's trade based and craft based skills gap in the UK. And we find there's an issue with getting them into the nuclear sector per se. So we're trying to understand what those barriers are, what they could be, how we could improve that. We've launched that internally, but we've also launched it on the Innocentive website which is the global open innovation platform. And the challenge is specifically directed at UK students in higher education. So if they have an idea and would like to enter into the challenge, there is prize money, um, but that's on the Innocentive platform and we've challenged that. So we want to kind of ask the younger generation or the next generation as to why aren't they going down those routes? What barriers could they see? Why are they real? How can we address those? And that's not only for us, but also for the sector. So yes, yeah, so we've run that recently. We also do open innovation, and this is where we're collaborating with universities and external companies. And I particularly like this phrase by Bill Joy of, of Sudden Microsystems. No matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for somebody else. And that's true of any business. There's a tremendous amount of wealth and knowledge outside of our business, and we must and should tap into it as and when we, we need it. We can't employ everyone in the world and all the smartest people. It'd be far too expensive and we, we won't have a business at the end of it. So we need to be open. So again, we will go down, we find any challenges that we have and we make them as accessible as possible and distill them down as what are the key technical requirements. We want to attract non-nuclear sectors. <clears throat> you know, we want to make it open so that somebody who hasn't got nuclear experience can understand what the real challenge is. And that's about us having targeted innovations. People can ideate and come up against our challenges. We want to bring in that divergent thinking. We want to ensure that there's you know, more eyes on the prize and looking at these challenges to understand what we're trying to achieve. We can take the nuclear aspects out of it. 
we take radiation away or nuclear aspects out of the challenge, essentially it can be a chemistry challenge, an engineering challenge, a software challenge, whatever it would be. So we break it down in those constituent parts because we can manage that side or we can manage it outside of the challenge. We also want to enable access to the sector. So more, in, more companies and more businesses can see nuclear as an avenue for them to grow their business. And we're also, by doing that in a two-way approach, allowing novel approaches come into our business and new ways of solutioning, but also allowing our guys to get exposure to different ways of looking at a problem, different technologies, different ways of addressing a challenge. So I want to talk to you about a project that we did, that we put out through that process. <coughs> So we're supporting the European Space Agency in their Heracles mission uh, to the moon. We uh, can take pl depleted plutonium dioxide uh, and extract the americium. When you extract the americium, the americium can then be used uh, for space batteries to power rovers that go on missions to Mars and the moon and so forth. Heracles is due to launch in the late 2020s and we've developed a process where we can extract this americium from the depleted plutonium and then it goes off to somewhere else and it produces this space battery. The current requirements are that we produce about 500 grams a year of this americium, so it's about half a bag of sugar. That's quite a lot. With our process as it stands, it requires people in glove boxes, similar to that, can't get you a picture of an actual glove box, of course. Um, similar to that, people hands in glove boxes, doing the process and we get the throughput. With that higher demand for 500 grams a year, there's a potential that an operator's contact dose would go over the allowable limit. So we set a challenge of how can we do this operation in a glove box, in a confined environment, yet reduce the contact dose for an operator. So that was the challenge that was set. We worked with our technical teams. We distilled it down into its constituent parts. We removed the kind of nuclear side of it, because essentially we just need to do something in a confined environment and perform several operations. This is what it looks like. So we launched our challenge statements. We went uh, externally as broad as we could. We launched it to about 50,000 innovators due to a variety of open innovation platforms. Um, look at academia, uh, other SMEs, micro SMEs, other companies, whatever it would be. So we launched that out there and asked people for ideas. We then followed that up with a webinar. So this gave our guys a chance to explain the challenge, present it, um, give some more colour to the challenge really, but also enable the applicants who are interested to speak to us, to ask us questions, to find out what the encumbrances were, to find out what, what the real challenges were, what the real kind of restrictions were and if there was any flex in that. We then went on, selected some applications and those that were successful, we moved on to a 12 week study. End of that 12 week study, uh, we had some uh, the outputs demonstrated, some produced a prototype for what their idea would be. Uh, we had those demonstrated our working term facility and then successful project went on to do a proof of concept. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that that is coming to an end at the end of next month. Uh, where we're looking to test those ideas in Workington inactively. So what do we go for? So we had an application from a company called Resolve Robotics. So obviously robotics company, systems engineering and so forth. We had a lot of robotic uh, solutions suggested for this. They're a small company, they're based in Cumbria, they're a handful of people. Um, one of the handful of people has a sideline in TV special effects and animatronics. So he came at it from a completely different angle. And he said, well, why don't you just have a mechanical hand? So you don't need all these robots and all these gantries and snakes and whatever it would be. So they said, actually, that's a brilliant idea because it's really simple. It's mechanical, so no electronics. We can sort out the materials for radiation sensitivity. Um, it allows our operators to remove their physical hands away from doing the actual contact work, but they still can see what they're doing in the glove box. So there's no need for cameras and uh, fancy systems and what have you. So that's our prototype. That they produced that in 12 weeks time. Uh, they're producing a much more sophisticated one. There's about seven month, eight month project. Um, that's what they produced in 12 weeks. They came and demonstrated at our facility, engaged with our technical teams, worked on what that next iteration would be. Um, and we're hopefully in April that we'll have two left and right uh, hands that we can then deploy in our active facilities and start producing, developing that Amorosium for the space station. We also want to act as a conduit for innovation. So a lot of the time, the amount of time it takes to get a technology through to being a deployable proposition through its deployment is disproportionate to the amount it takes to develop it. 
Um, and I was thinking, you know, there's a tremendous amount of hurdles and barriers and things that you need to qualify if you're ever going to deploy a technology on a nuclear site licensed site. And it's completely alien to you if you're not in the industry. So it basically comes down to, you know, you don't know what you don't know. We do know. We do that all the time. So we can support third parties to validate their technology in representative infrastructure and validate their technologies and enable them to understand what it's going to require to get their thing through the barriers, across the fence, into a site. You know, we're used to working in a highly regulated industry. We do safety cases all day long, we do technical files. We can advise on design considerations, uh, material selection. So does it need to be heat resistant, radiation resistant, strong acid resistant? And ultimately, we know what it is to make something deployable. So how can we know you may be able to get a technology that can work for where it is once it gets there, but what's actually the route it gets there? There may be other restrictions and other encumbrances in doing that. And at the centre of all of this is our sort of suitably qualified, experienced or SQUET personnel and qualified workers. So these are people who can physically go and deploy something on site and can also got the experience of deploying novel technologies. So we can provide that support and guidance uh, and help to third parties who are interested in getting into the sector. We've got a fantastic facility up at Workington, uh, as Nick mentioned in our rig call. One of the uh, rigs in there is TED, so our technology and experimental demonstration rig. Uh, it's a very flexible rig, it's multi gantried um, You can add parts to it, add pipe work to it. And essentially that's there as a model to show representation of what it might be like to deploy something on a site. We became aware of a company called Firma Engineering. They're uh, SME based out in Doncaster. Um, they don't traditionally work in the nuclear industry, um, but they responded to a challenge that Sellafield put out and they developed a articulated arm. So this arm on the far side there, it can go, it's done on the TED rig, so that's on the top gantry, it can go down uh, several metres down and then it can extend at a 90 degree angle and then go out several metres across. And at the end of that arm, you could put radiometric sensor, LIDAR scanner, LIBS, whatever it would be, camera, for example. So that's really, in, that's excellent opportunity there. If you want to access a vessel that's below several metres of concrete and then there's a drop of about 10 metres or so forth. They've not worked in nuclear before. We've got them up to work in turn. We demonstrated using our, so we're now providing them support and expertise on the safety cases, on the HAZOPs, um, on the technical file. And then ultimately we're going to help them deploy this the technology onto site in an active environment uh, in the next few months. We also work in a similar fashion with universities. So a quick example here is Brunel Innovation Centre. They had a technology for originally developed for the oil and gas sector about having an ultrasonic collar to disrupt blockages in pipe work. Um, we thought well, the potential that we could use is in the nuclear sector, but sometimes our pipe work isn't accessible because it's buried in concrete. So how can we modify this technology and develop it so that we could then deploy it in the nuclear sector itself? Again, they've not worked in the nuclear sector, they're academics, they're not going to go onto site, they're suddenly not going to rock up at a plant and start deploying it. So we're using our expertise to support them and transfer that technology into the nuclear sector. And we're also doing relevant demonstrations at our facility in Workington. And to wrap up from me, a um, number of ways that we you know, interact for innovation at NNL, we have our internally derived ideas that we foster and enjoy that culture of generating ideas. Wrapped around that, we have our open innovation. We're always looking to collaborate and partner with uh, external companies. And then with that innovation and neighbour as well, where we want to people who've got an idea that they think could be valuable for the sector, we can help them validate that um, and progress that further. Oh, cool, that's it from me. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. Um, at this point, I'll hand over for our closing remark Closing remarks to Dr. Martin Morledge, uh, Head of Commercial Operations at the University. Thank you, Martin. Got some words, so don't worry. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, for coming today for all of you in the room and those of you attending online. Um, and a great thanks goes to our speakers. <clears throat> and having listened today to how we embed enterprise and harness research, it reminded me of my time undertaking research when I started life to Nick as a, as a geologist and then went on to uh, geochemistry uh, and really understanding something that one of my supervisors once said to me and passed on some words of wisdom, which was one month in the library saves three months in the laboratory. 
or in the context of today's meeting, that one month in the library, that doing the research, the know-how, the know-who, um, actually saves those three months in the laboratory, that hard work, the outputs, the doing the day job, the trying to implement change, the keeping up with the rest. So that really important bit, doing that one month saves all that time. Were they correct? Has it played out in my own research? Has it seen in my working life? Have we seen where this has gone along and worked alongside businesses, the voluntary sectors for a number of years? Well, of course, the answer is yes. I've seen it played out time and time again in terms of the activities that we take, those that undertake research, take time to understand the data, time to embed themselves and understand the changing world around them. They value that input from others. They value that understanding, but they drive innovation. They save time, they save resources. They support and deliver a better outcome to their customers and the quality of the care that they can give it. And they deliver targets again and again and again. So taking that time, spending that money on research, building your networks, developing those relationships, that, that you know, time in the library again, it's not wasted effort. It really is something that is really important. It's better than going on a hunch. So I would say embedding that research, what we've heard today into your processes and upskilling yourselves in this area of how you implement research, how you understand enterprise is fundamental in today's world. We've also learned today, and I really would thank this in terms of the way that students can implement that at the University of Chester, how student projects, student placements, even recent graduates can also speed up that process of bringing new ideas, driving new technology, bringing expertise into your, your area. So I really would commend to you. And we've seen today that it works. So I would say, please understand how we do it. The contact information from the university will be available on site today. And I would say, please contact us. Please contact the people that you've heard today because we are exemplars of why and how research and enterprise is important to be embedded. So again, I would really like to say thank you to our speakers for their passion, sharing with us their stories and their aspirations for the future. And it's great to see how that works from small to large companies. It's always the same. So as I bring this event to a close, uh, I already look forward to seeing you at our next networking event. And I hope to see more of you back in the room, but all of you online, I, you'll still be there as well. And of course, everybody here, you can watch us back at your leisure. So please take care of yourselves and each other. And until next time, goodbye.